Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm sure we'll have a few more join here, but I can go ahead and get started with the intro so we um, maximize uh, our time together. Thanks for joining. This is the uh, second in our in Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action's um, 2020 webinar series, Health in Virginia's Changing Climate. We are very pleased today to have uh, Dr. Holly Gaff from Old Dominion University join us, and we'll get a bit into her intro in just a second. My name is John Bagel. I work with uh, VCCA. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes to start us off here. Uh, all participants are in listen-only mode. Um, we'll likely keep it that way unless there's a, a need for a clarifying question, at which point we can, we can allow individuals to talk. Um, but uh, anyone at any point throughout the presentation today, um, you should see a Q&A box on whatever platform you're using uh, to view this webinar um, uh, at the bottom or top of your screen. That's uh, the method that we'll use to collect questions. Feel free to put them in the, the chat box at any point. Um, we'll be getting, I'll, I'm uh, gonna turn it over in just a second to uh, VCCA's chair, Dr. Samantha Dute. Um, but uh, after Sam's intro, we'll get the presentation about 25 um, to 30 minutes tops from Dr. Gaff. Um, then we'll cover a couple of uh, upcoming advocacy opportunities. Um, and then open it up for questions. Again, uh, the questions that are submitted through that platform. Um, so we thank you for joining us today and I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Adu. Good afternoon, thank you, John. I'm so glad everyone was able to join this call today amidst all the other issues that we are all confronting. And today we're gonna to be hearing from Dr. Holly Gaff, a wonderful speaker about tick-borne diseases in Virginia. Dr. Gaff earned her PhD in mathematics at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. She is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Old Dominion University, and her research interests have focused mainly on studying the ecology of ticks and tick-borne diseases through an active surveillance project and mathematical modeling. She's published more than 75 peer-reviewed articles and has funding from NIH, CDC, DOD, USDA, and others. She currently leads the ODU Tick Research Team, which is a team of faculty, graduate, and undergraduate students working to better understand the ecology of ticks and tick-borne pathogens in Virginia for more than 10 years. The ODU Research Team has been running a long-term active tick surveillance program in Virginia since 2009, which has led to the discovery and mapping of tick populations moving into and across Virginia as well as spanning many other related projects. Dr. Gaff also holds an honorary appointment at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Durban, South Africa, and works with scientists throughout Southern Africa on the challenges of ticks and tick-borne pathogens there. So I'm very pleased now to hand, uh, hand it over to Dr. Gaff. Thank you for the kind introduction. Let me get this slideshow started. So I am delighted to always to have an audience willing to hear all about the, the fun and amazing world that ticks provide us. Um, it is, of course, of, of public health and, and medical concerns, but I think it's some interesting things and there are certainly changes going on in our world that are worth, worth considering. So um, let's get started. So I think all of you, if you're on this call, are aware of all of the potential changes that are coming with climate change, including increased temperature, changes in precipitation pattern, extreme events, and sea level rise. And all of these can affect um, ticks and tick-borne diseases in some very, very different ways. Uh, there's been papers that were published by the EPA looking at um, uh, indicators of climate change. And, and so one of the ones that they often track is Lyme disease cases. So incidence of Lyme disease certainly has increased over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, but what's interesting to me about ticks is it's not a uniform process and it's not as, as simple to track as some other diseases that are more related, like mosquitoes are more closely tied to climate and ticks are much more challenging. So I enjoy the challenge. Um, you can certainly see this increase in Lyme disease um, from originally having most of the cases in the New England area to now spreading out. And in, in if you follow from 2014 forward, it's continued to spread through Virginia and in North Carolina now. 
um, which is kind of opposite of what you would expect. So the climate change direction of Lyme disease is more along the lines of the movement into Canada. So the Canadian border, so those are the maps. I always love maps that actually acknowledge countries around the country of interest. But the maps, um, if you can see this, the, the endemic areas in the red, this is from uh, some uh, Canadian information, are looking at the bleed over of, of tick-borne diseases, particularly Lyme disease, moving up into um, the various provinces of Canada. And they've had some significant increases in incidents up there as well. Um, the expansion into Virginia we'll talk a little bit more about as we talk about our particular research here. But another expansion, actually here's the Virginia data, sorry, so this is the Virginia data from 2009 to uh, 2018, um, kind of showing you the, the march through time across the state as it starts out in northern Virginia and moves across down the mountains and all the way into the Roanoke and uh, Blacksburg area. What we keep waiting for and expect to happen at some point is the wraparound back into the um, coastal plain where we are here in Virginia at Old Dominion University and have been interested in watching to see that it does not happen as quickly as we would expect. So we're still struggling to figure out a lot of things and that's one of them, but the movement southward is definitely a real movement um, of, of ticks and Lyme disease into our area. Um, Lone Star ticks, which is a much more common tick in our area, have also been on the move. So when I started studying them in the 90s, I was in Tennessee and it was the northern edge of their of their range. So this pixelated old, old map was kind of the northern extension. It was really only, you know, up into Kentucky, here through uh, Virginia, and maybe a little bit into New Jersey, but not a lot further. And then if we look at the official CDC map from 2015, it's now gone all the way up into the Maine and the New England area, and up into the treading towards the Midwest. Um, a more recent map actually shows it's all the way through Michigan now, which is where my family actually lives and have sent me many pictures that I can testify it has definitely moved up there as well as into Wisconsin and Minnesota. So this tick kind of like the, the Lyme disease in the Canada and the Canada is also doing a northward expansion as we have climate that supports the, the ticks and probably more likely the, the hosts are also expanding in those areas. So I want to get a little bit of a background on what exactly a tick is because it's kind of a, a bit of help in understanding the dynamics of these guys. Um, so ticks are not insects, they actually are arthropods, they're more closely related to spiders. Um, and they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, as you can see here by the different um, colors and, and patterns, and um, they share some common things and they don't share other common things. I'm exclusively looking at hard ticks today, there are other types of ticks called soft ticks that I'm going to kind of ignore today, but they are important in other parts of the world more than they are here in the Virginia area. Um, a few basics about them. There's about 875 species worldwide. We have somewhere between 14 and 16 here in Virginia. Some haven't been seen for a while. They're moving in, they're moving out. You can find them on every continent, including Antarctica. Um, they do feed on penguins and they feed on other birds that, that move in and out of Antarctica. So that's, they're in the nests of animals down there. As I mentioned, they are not insects. They are carids. Um, and they are vectors of human pathogens, which of course is one of the things we're talking about today. They're second to mosquitoes in the world, but within the United States and Virginia and Hampton Roads, they are the, the number one um, vector for human-borne diseases. Um, they are also of concern to veterinarians and wildlife. Um, ticks are bizarre in the senses of how they either choose specific hosts or they feed on all hosts. Um, most will feed on almost any invertebrate invertebr that's out there, um, there are very few things that are safe from ticks. Um, they have a very unique life history compared to a lot of other um, vectors that we think about, and I call it a punctuated life history. And the most important factor in this is the, the long-lived nature of these particular bugs. Um, ticks will live for two to three years for most of the ones we have around here, but during that time they only feed three times at most. So they'll, the eggs will be laid usually in some kind of vegetative area. They emerge as larvae, which by the way have six legs. Um, the larvae will feed on something, generally fall off, spend the next eight months to a year in the leaf litter, emerge again as a nymph, which now has eight legs. And um, feed, if they're lucky enough to feed, then they'll fall off again, spend another year just waiting and molting in the leaf litter until they emerge as adults the male and female at that point, who then mate, lay eggs, and start the process again. So that 
that process takes a, takes a very long time um, and ticks can just go into these diacent uh, diapause, these very long hibernation periods, waiting for hosts to be around, waiting for the right weather conditions. And so while uh, this is what makes it so challenging to tie their history to climate changes is that they, they are much more patient and much more tolerant of almost any conditions that are out there. The humidity is the, the key thing, but it's not necessarily air humidity, it can be ground level humidity, which depends on the plants and depends on a whole bunch of other things since they live down in leaf litter and in the brush, um, waiting for the next uh, life stage to emerge and feed again. Um, so some of the more, again, interesting things about them to me is how they find us. There are two approaches to that in life for ticks. They can either be an ambush hunter or a hunter hunter. So ambush ticks just sit and wait. They'll crawl to the top of vegetation, maybe six to eight inches off the ground and extend their forelegs. So this tick here, you can see has its forelegs out. At the end of that first foreleg, at the end of that first leg is what's called a howler's organ. So they have a sensory organ at the end of their first legs that allow them to um, sense a number of things. They can smell chemicals like carbon dioxide. Um, they've, there's a paper that came out a couple years ago that actually showed some infrared scepters. So they actually are heat sensing. They have some sound cues. They can smell um, nitrogen, all kinds of other pheromones. They can, they, so they can both are attempt, attempt to somewhere between a smell and a taste for their hosts as well as for mates once they're adults. That's how they also find each other. Um, and so they'll often, when they, we jokingly call it, they're waving at us. So while they're waving, they're really just smelling us to see whether or not we, they are what they want to eat. Um, and so the hunter ticks will actually then, if they sense the change in carbon dioxide, will actually pursue you on the ground. Um, and some of them are pretty darn quick. So um, they will definitely um, chase you down if you sit in the woods for very long. And so the Lone Star tick that's, that's shown here actually uh, practices both. It will sit and wait, but it will also chase you down. And I have certainly seen them move quite, quite some speeds um, across the ground. Um, the Lone Star tick, as well as a lot of ticks, are very uh, what's termed Catholic, small c in the entomology world, which means very not picky. Um, other ticks are very specific. Um, there's always a classic example of a tick species that we think is extinct because it only fed on a rhinoceros. And as the rhinoceros populations in Africa have declined, the tick species that fed exclusively on that rhino um, are th thought to be actually be extinct because it didn't ever adapt to feeding on anything else. Um, so there's a blown up picture of the howler's organ um, inside that first foreleg, which is a, uh, we're slowly figuring out how it works and it seems to be very unique to each different type of tick species. Um, if they do find a host that they like, their blood feeding behavior is pretty phenomenal as well. They usually find a site that's protected. So, you know, I call them the warm and, the warm and dark areas. They cut into the skin. If you can see the mouth parts here of the tick, the very extended parts are what's called chelicery, which are sharper. They're very, very sharp. Um, if you ever cut yourself with a piece of sharp glass, you don't almost feel it. That's why ticks can cut you and not feel it. Then they're serrated, and so they cut with the very beginning of it and slowly insert their way through your skin. And then they insert this, this hypostome, this next piece, which is kind of like a drinking straw. And then they in inject you with saliva that has an amazing suite of chemicals into it. Um, anticoagulants, anti-inflammatories, but it also has um, other, uh, other chemicals that increase blood flow to the area. So it causes just enough damage to increase and create a feeding pool of blood there, but suppressing all the wound healing and inflammation responses that our body generally has to that kind of response. Um, this particular type of uh, hard ticks that we're talking about also excrete a cement, and so they actually cement themselves in. Their goal is to be there for two to 14 days, um, and during which time the soft ticks, which we don't talk about a whole lot, but the male hard ticks and the immatures, uh, male hard ticks, just stretch their cuticle, but females and those nymphs and larvae actually will create an entire new cuticle while they are feeding. And so they, they dissolve their exoskeleton. They do all kinds of amazing things to be able to take enough blood. Um, and they don't actually take whole blood either. They take, um, they take the whole blood and then they excrete the water and salts that back through their mid, from their mid gut, through their, uh, 
hemolymph to the salivary glands and back into you. And so um, ticks don't, hard ticks don't tend to exsanguinate an animal, but they're certainly anemiate it as they take all of the good protein parts so that the um, animal is left with just um, water and salts back essentially. So what got us interested in studying ticks now, of course, are these increases I talked about in tick-borne diseases, um, both in where and how much. It feels a little unpredictable. There's not a uniform distribution that's not as easy as um, some kind of contact tracing, figuring out where you got the tick, what, what, where did you pick it up, what tick is it, how are they expanding, and there's all kinds of different movements in all the directions because of um, climate change and because of host dynamic changes. Um, so in 2009, we started a long-term study here at ODU looking at the tick ecology and tick-borne pathogens in Hampton Roads. And we collect ticks from the field, and from that we've determined a lot of the information about what pathogens they carry in this area, as well as a little bit broader. Some of our work has taken us to other parts of Virginia. Um, and the goal is coming back to actually doing some mathematical modeling, which, as was mentioned in the intro, is my original um, calling in life, if you will to really understand where the high risk areas are and then hopefully figure out how we could possibly control it or reduce the risk for human disease. So for this process, we go out every week, every other week since 2009. Right now we've kind of got a modified version of this with COVID, we're um, not allowed to collect quite as much as normal, but we've tried to maintain as much as we can of this long-term surveillance so that we don't have a, a huge gap in our, in our data set. Um, the orange dots here are all of the different field sites that we try to get to every week or every other week. Um, we collect ticks mostly through vegetation flagging. So if you can see the picture here, there's a white denim cloth about a meter squared attached to a dowel rod. We drag it through the vegetation. Every few meters, we flip it over and pick all the ticks off of it and put it into a jar. We take those ticks back to the lab, freeze them, and then we sort them, count them, and so forth. Freezing is dry enough in the freezers to desiccate them to the point that we can pretty much guarantee that they're dead at that point and safe to handle. Uh, not every tick is up and looking for animals the size of humans. And so there are plenty of ticks that only like to feed on small animals. So we do rodent live trapping to get ticks off of the, of the ticks that would be interested in the rodents, which includes some of the immature stages of many of the ticks that will feed on humans as adults. Um, we go to hunt check stations to pick ticks off deer. We stop at roadkill. We talk, talk to veterinarians. We ask for humans to donate ticks. We've done mist netting for birds, we've done reptiles. We've really just tried to get an idea of really the whole suite of understanding what's going on in, in Virginia as things have been changing so rapidly in our, in our state for tick-borne diseases. What we expected to find when we went out was a black-legged tick, the Lone Star tick and the dog tick. These are the ones that have been reported in the area forever and ever. What we didn't expect to find were a couple invading species, one of which is very pertinent to human health and the other is not a human biter, but could amplify Lyme disease in the, in the, in the wildlife, which could then spill over into more cases for humans. Um, kind of give you some idea of the abundance of ticks that we collect in a general year. Um, most years, this is total ticks, are between about 2010, we still were getting all of our permits in place, but 2011 forward has been the same amount of effort. And so we get anywhere from 15,000 to about 35,000 ticks, depending on we're not sure what yet. We haven't figured that out. So we have had years where we had, have had abundances of ticks. We've had years without abundances of ticks. In 2012, I used to say this was the year because it was such a warm winter, which is what people always assume would increase tick populations, that this is a warm winter. And uh, that gave us such a bumper crop of ticks that year. Well, of course, that meant we continued sampling until our next highest year is 2018. And for anyone who was here in January of 2018, that's when we had the bombogenesis with 18 inches of snow and one of the coldest winters on record. So kind of threw out the theory that warm, warm winters were going to lead to more ticks. It seems to be much more complicated than that. Um, if you can see the colors in these graphs, the majority of the bar is blue, which is our Lone Star ticks, which is 95% of what you'll collect, especially in the eastern two-thirds of Virginia. The little top parts are all the other ticks combined. So generally, if people encounter ticks in our area, it is a Lone Star tick. So here's our Lone Star tick, just a little bit of background on that. There's the um, name for the dot on the female. So the adult female has a dot on her back. All three life stages of this tick will, um, will definitely uh, will um, 
will feed on humans. And so, um, oops, go back a second here. The, uh, the Lone Star Chick has been around since the 70s. It's definitely one of the, the things it is known for is it feeds on white-tailed deer. So white-tailed deer are ubiquitous these days. And so what you, with, with what we call, when we drive past white-tailed deer, I just call it tick food. So as all this tick food has moved around, the ticks have come with it. Um, the things to be aware of with, with this particular tick um, include ehrlichiosis. Um, ehrlichiosis is a, is a, is a pretty serious human disease. Uh, it's caused by Ehrlichia chaffiensis, um, which is, of course, a, one of these rickettsial bacteria. So it's an intercellular bacteria. Um, it invades the monocytes. Again, the reservoir for this disease is also white-tailed deer. So as the deer have come, um, this disease has come with it. Um, and it starts out with like a lot of these with um, fever, headache, myelage, everything pretty much tick-borne comes with the same um, set of symptoms in the beginning. Um, the cases here in Virginia have, have, you know, we have them. This is both Ehrlichia and Anaplasma combined. Um, the incidence rate is low, but it is, it is exists. It is a particular concern for um, immunocompromised and elderly individuals that are out. Um, we jokingly call this a lot of times the related uh, to golfing. So people who are golfers tend to be out a bit more, um, which is because at the beginning when I got into this research, there was an outbreak near a golf course, a retirement facility that had a golf course adjacent to it, and the disease <clears throat> hit, the, hit the retirement community, but it seemed to only affect bad golfers. So maybe there's some, some lessons here. If you're a bad golfer, you should not go out golfing. Um, we have tested our ticks, and it's a very um, focal outbreak. It seems to be if there's a deer that has it, it'll amplify it quickly into the ticks in that area, and then it'll be gone. So we have had places that we have found where Ehrlichia chaffiensis has been up to 5% of the lone stars that we test in that area, and then it'll be gone. So there'll be hot spots, which is why these disease outbreaks tend to be very focal and then gone. Ehrlichia ewingii, which is another one that can cause ehrlichiosis in humans, we have found up to 80% positive in a single location at a single point in time. Um, generally, it's closer to 0.01%, but there are, there are these, these individual spots, hot spots, that seem to pop up from time to time. One of the other big things to be aware of is the STARI, the Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness, right, is increasing. Um, the rash resembles the Lyme disease rash, and so it's often confused between the two. People get very panicked. Um, this is what's helpful to know what tick it bit the person. There are plenty of studies that are showing that um, lone, lone star ticks cannot transmit Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the causative agent of Lyme disease, but they can certainly transmit we're not quite sure what. Some people thought it was Borrelia lone star eye, but that's not sure if that's true or not. Something causes this kind of similar rash in people um, to, to Lyme disease, which makes it very confusing from a diagnostic perspective. So something to keep in mind um, when, when seeing these kind of patients. The other big important thing that's going on right now that I probably talk about more than anything, because while all of these diseases we talk about could kill you, this one apparently people care more about losing the ability to eat a hamburger has raised a lot of concern with people, and rightly so. It is an anaphylaxis, and that should always be taken seriously, um, and particularly because it's a delayed anaphylaxis after eating. Um, and the alpha-gal is a specific allergen in the tick saliva, um, and it's a protein in non-primate mammals. And so um, it, it will restrict people who have this allergy that's triggered. We still don't completely understand this. There's some excellent researchers at EVA and UNC that are working on truly teasing apart how all of this works. So I think it's definitely a um, evolving story that we'll all have to pay attention to. Um, briefly going through our other ticks here. So the dog tick is uh, probably one of the most common human biters other than the Lone Star in the Commonwealth. Um, originally, this was the one of most concern from the fact that it's a known vector for Rocky Mountain spotted fever, true Rocky Mountain spotted fever caused by Rickettsia rickettsii, um, which is a severe disease. It's a heck, high case fatality rate. Um, it's been reportable since the 20s. But our data, much like everybody else's data, has found zero positives for this particular pathogen in the thousands and thousands of ticks that we have collected and tested. So it's raised a lot of questions as to a lot of people get reported as having RMSF, or Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, but what seems to be is that it, 
the, the case definition is slowly changing to being a spotted fever group or catsiosis because they all cross react from an antibody perspective. And so this could potentially explain why there seems to be a decrease in case fatality. It used to be about a 30% case fatality, which is terrifying if you ask me. And now we're down to much, much lowered, almost no case fatality. People are still miserable. It has a lot of morbidity, but very little mortality. And we're not quite sure what other spotted fever group or catsiosis are, are, are causing this. Um, I'll tell you about one that's invaded our state recently in a minute here, but some interesting um, discussions to be and some more work to do to understand how these how this trade-off is happening and if it really is a milder rickettsia rickettsii or if it's other rickettsia that are involved. Um, the most common culprit that people know about it or are most worried about is the black-legged tick, um, Ixodes scapularis. Um, it obviously is a known vector for a lot of things including Lyme disease. Um, I think it's important to remind all of us that the EM rash, that that erythema migraines rash, the bullseye rash, it happens, depending on which paper you read, between 20 and 70% of cases. And also importantly for um, uh, people of color is that it's very difficult to see these EM rashes if you have, uh, if you have patients um, without Caucasian skin. It's, a, it's much more difficult to see. Um, it causes all the usual flu-like symptoms and paralysis and of the face, potentially uh, untreated. It, goes, it has all kinds of chronic sequelae that um, uh, cause a lot of challenges for a lot of people. Um, anaplasmosis is another pathogen that it, or disease you can get from the pla uh, rickettsial pathogen it can transmit. Um, it is very rare. Um, it does have a lower case fatality rate because it's, it, it's if caught early and treatable. Um, babesiosis is another one. It's a, it's a protozoan. All these again are listed as flu-like when you start down this road. Um, this one will infect red blood cells. More often, it seems that Babesia microti, the protozoan, much like malaria, will often be transmitted from asymptomatic patients through blood transfusions. Um, we have uh, Borrelia miyamotoi, which is a relapsing borreliosis. Um, again, flu-like symptoms, but it's more cyclical in nature. Um, this one, unlike the Borrelia burgdorferi, actually will be trans really transmitted, so larvae. So that first life stage before it's even fed on anything can be positive and transmit this particular pathogen. Um, the one that scares me the most are all the viruses. I, I pretend they don't exist because I think they're extremely terrifying in, the, in their high case fatality rate and just severe chronic sequelae for those who do recover. Um, we actually don't currently test for them just from a financial issue. Um, there's been a couple cases of Powassan virus here in Virginia. And we actually now have an excellent researcher at Virginia Tech who was uh, interested in starting to work on viruses in the, in the Commonwealth. So I think that's, that's fantastic to have uh, uh, more people working on ticks across the state in various aspects. Um, just for your data perspective, our, when we've tested the scapularis that we've caught over the last 10, 12 years, about a quarter of them will have Borrelia burgdorferi, so they could potentially transmit Lyme disease if they feed long enough. Um, Borrelia metamotoi, we're down around the one to three percent. Anaplasma phagocytophilum, I think we have found in one tick out of all the years we've tested. Borrelia uh, babesia microti, about 0.3 percent. So those are some of the more uncommon ones, but they still occur and there are certainly reported cases to the state. One of the invading ticks of, of great concern from a human health perspective is the Gulf Coast tick. It is a very large, very aggressive tick. This is one of the ones that will chase you down. Um, and what it's brought into the state as it's moved in over the last five, 10 years is this tidewater spotted fever, or it's also called, called Rickettsia parkeri rickettsiosis. The big difference between this and the other Rickettsia, spotted fever group rickettsiosis are um, that it causes what's called an eschar at the bite site, or it looks like a cigarette burn, or people often think of it as a spider bite scab. And then it causes a rash and it can be quite severe in its, in its symptoms. Thus far, we have not had anyone report that they have fatalities from it, but it is quite um, severe in its outcome and often ends up with people hospitalized before they recover. So the Eshkar here is, the, is one of the key spots. Um, we haven't quite figured out how this is exactly happening since the Gulf Coast tick is so large, it's one of the few ticks you can actually feel bite you. So as an adult, it seems to 
um, give itself away. Um, it's also a known pest of livestock. Um, but the concern is the fact that 50 to 70 percent of the ticks that we test are positive for this pathogen. There's another one related called Rickettsia DNA, very low, but I mean this is a this is a very high percentage of ticks to have this pathogen. Um, and Rickettsias now are starting to be shown. I mentioned a minute ago that Borrelia people have the studies in their minds that there are some good studies that show that it looks maybe 24, 48 hours for that particular pathogen before the, that the tick has to be attached. But for the Rickettsias, we're looking probably at more like one to four hours for transmission after attachment. So it's already in the in the th spread throughout the tick, and so it is it is a much faster, not quite as fast as the 15 minutes for viruses, but is definitely a much faster transmission cycle and of, of great concern. Um, the reason that we think that maybe some of the ways that this particular pathogen is getting into people, since you can feel a Gulf Coast tick adult bite you is that we're finding it spills over into our known other species in the area. So lone star ticks and dog ticks, sharing the same sites, sharing the same hosts, seem to have some spillover from these very highly infected Gulf Coast ticks through the wildlife to these other tick species. And so while one to 2% of lone stars doesn't sound like much, there's hundreds of thousands of them out there and that's a much more likely encounter. Same thing with dog ticks. So what's causing all these increases, right? This is one of the great mysteries and one of the reasons we're working on this and the sudden explosions of all these tick-borne diseases, right? And we have this high rate of Lyme disease in the mid-Atlantic. I mean, a lot of it we can look at as uh, issues with habitat fragmentation. We are now living more in the wild. Um, the, like I had mentioned earlier, this significant increase in white-tailed deer populations um, has really pushed a lot of um, tick food everywhere. We don't want coyotes, but we certainly like Bambi. And so we have created some very unbalanced ecosystems and ticks just kind of come along with that. Um, we've also made it where there are, climate change certainly helps quite a bit in that it's warm and moist in our area. And those are great options for ticks. So they're not under any kind of pressure from climate change. Um, the, the hurricanes, we tested ticks a few years ago. One of my students asked a great question of, whether ticks drown and we actually found that they could live underwater for up to 75 days. So they do not drown. Um, they will not be going away from that, that kind of idea. And so why it's suddenly moving and how it's moving and all of those kinds of questions are a lot of the research that I have students doing over the next few years. So stay tuned. Maybe we'll have something figured out at some point. Um, once the lab reopens, we do test ticks, whether that's a value to individuals or not is still of, of uh, a question, but at least it's of interest to us. Um, for for a small donation, we do give answers back within a couple days. Once the lab reopens again, we're closed right now. But um, in the future, this is something that, that folks could think about. Um, if people want to just donate ticks, we take them for free. We just don't give answers back on the pathogens. Um, and so that's the um, what I have to to talk about. And I think there's the Q and A. Um, section at the bottom. So <clears throat> I assume some of these, let's see, some of these I may have answered at this point. Um, so what do ticks, so the first, so I don't know if you want me to do questions first or if you'd like to do the advocacy first. This is Sam, I think we could do the uh, sure. first. Yeah, that sounds great. You, you can go ahead and um, get the screen back um, on yours, or we can actually, I've got one here we can have. So if everybody with, with questions can use the Q&A box, we've got a lot here that we'll go through, but uh, if you have others, um, uh, go ahead. But Holly, yeah, back to you if you can see the questions. Sure, so I can see a few of them. So the question, first question was the, um, how do they find warm-blooded animals to latch onto, so that's that, that Haller's organ I mentioned, so they certainly can sense carbon dioxide and heat. Um, the witch tick is responsible for alpha-gal. That is definitely currently only shown for the Lone Star. There's a new paper out looking that it might also be Ixodes scapularis and or some other ticks. Um, in Australia, there's another tick, Ixodes holocyclus, and a few other ticks around the world. 
So I, was, I think that's an evolving question. Um, but certainly I can say the Lone Star Tick is the one that's being blamed for the majority of it here. Um, do ticks dissolve their cement when they drop off? Absolutely, they do. They, uh, they excrete a substance that dissolves it, just but it takes them quite some time. Um, and so that's why when people always say the tick will back out, well, the tick takes about an hour to cement in and about an hour to release. So they, they it takes a while to create the cement as well as to dissolve that cement to drop off. Um, why is the Lone Star Tick so prominent? Um, so the Lone Star Tick, I think, is so prominent because it is a weed species. So it's, a, it's really able to feed on anything bigger than a bread box. And so it does very well in areas where you have raccoons, possums, and white-tailed deer, which are other weed species. And so they're kind of this weed of the, of the tick world that goes with the weeds of the animal world that just do really well in disturbed habitat. And we are, as, um, as suburbanites, really good at creating disturbed habitat. Um, the Asian longhorn tick, yeah, I didn't mention the Asian longhorn tick. Uh, it's definitely in Virginia. The state is, is tracking that, State Department of Health. Interestingly, here in the coastal plain, we have found none of them, so I'm not sure why. We've looked back through all our years and years of data collections and have, have not found them. We have looked in all the same places people are looking. Um, I think the closest is just west of Richmond was the closest I'd heard of this. So out west in Roanoke and other areas of the state, there are certainly established populations. Um, and it looks like there's now people going back through their samples that have found it from 2014, 2010 timeframe. So it's been around for a while. Um, so the, which leads me to the next question. So the, you know, the sampling, I sample Hampton Roads. I have collaborators. The question was, what about other areas? Um, there's folks at University of Richmond now, there's folks at Holland University and University of uh, Virginia Tech University and George Mason University. And we just had a call a couple weeks ago to try and help collaborate all of us of thinking about sampling, but we certainly welcome any citizen science. Uh, we have people mailing us ticks all the time and that's, that's one of our best ways to figure out where to do some kind of long-term sampling is, is this crowdsourcing idea. Um, so I think what, if the people are interested in, in, in participating in that, feel free to email me and I can get you in contact with whichever place you're closest to, um, to, to see what they're interested in. And I know the state was also interested in having some ticks mailed to them. Um, so the warm and moist, right? So living in the Eastern mountains of the Commonwealth is better off. I think that's just, it's more of a trade-off, right? So, uh, uh, we certainly have an abundance of ticks here compared to out west, but there are different ticks that like the cold and drier areas. Um, yeah, the western part of the Commonwealth is more has more exotic scapularis and fewer lone stars, so I think you just trade off which ticks you get. Um, and the best way to remove a tick that's attached to your skin is with a pair of either a pair of pointy tweezers close to your skin as possible and pull it straight up or there are the tick spoons and tick twisters and a lot of things like that that actually do work pretty well as well. So any way that you can get as much of the tick, their head is not inside the skin, it's not gonna inject itself back in and it will at most cause only as much irritation as a splinter would. So um, the um, tick repellent, right, is I use a combination of DEET and permethrin, DEET does pretty well on uh, exotic scapularis. Low black-legged ticks don't like DEET, but permethrin doesn't, lone star ticks don't care about DEET, so permethrin on my clothes and DEET on my skin is the combination of what I recommend, what the CDC recommends, of course, following all label directions, if you tolerate those kinds of um, uses. Um, and so, um, and the other, I think the last question was the reporting of RMSF. So Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is reportable. It's just been changed in this reporting in 2009, I believe, to being all, RM, all Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever cases are reported as Spotted Fever group or Ketiosis because they don't want to say that they can differentiate. And there are cases in, that they've gone and followed up with where they are truly Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever because they can find the pathogen but generally they're probably a different rickettsia. And so they've kind of just made this umbrella term, which 
has reporting, which is also reportable as these spotted peeper groups. So, and with that, I will turn it back. Great, thank you so much, Holly. That was really interesting. Um, we did want to just very briefly um, cover as an as ongoing component of this webinar series, just a, a few advocacy opportunities um, that are always out there before us. Um, today wanted to highlight that uh, the uh, censoring science rule, which we've talked about before, which would limit the um, EPA's science that they can consider in setting regulations, is, uh, is there's a proposed rollback um, that is open for public comment uh, until May 17th. Um, you can see that the American Lung Association has a great action for health professionals and non-health professionals at lung.org slash save science. Um, the next EPA rollback um, that's really under threat is uh, the particulate matter standards, which the EPA recently said that they would keep the same, which are generally considered fairly weak um, at a time where we need to be reducing and, and focusing on reducing air, pollu air pollution. We have a public hearing coming up in a couple of weeks. It's all online, obviously, all virtual. Um, happy to provide talking points um, to you, but it is a great opportunity for citizens to weigh in um, and, and argue for improved air quality and less air pollution um, through that public hearing at the EPA where you can join and, and I don't think you would have to join for more than 30 minutes or so um, in order to provide testimony. So um, there's a, a registration link, but I, again, my email address is at the bottom of this page and I'm happy to provide resources or more information on any of this. And the last advocacy action that we wanted to highlight um, is just that uh, Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action recently joined a lot of other health and medical organizations in writing to um, federal congressional leadership, asking that uh, as the um, coronavirus recovery um, economic recovery takes place that we invest in a, a public health infrastructure that is better equipped to respond to both pandemics like COVID-19 and the next pandemic in the global health emergency that we know we face in climate change. So keeping those two things in mind uh, is something that we want on the mind of our political leaders. And uh, that letter has uh, you know, circulated in press a little bit, but certainly there are opportunities to incorporate that into local letters to the editor um, that you might write for your local paper. And we're happy to provide resources, talking points and templates on all of those actions. But um, with that, we will uh, close out this webinar and uh, I'll, I'll give Sam the opportunity to sign off, but wanna thank everybody for joining, Sam. Yes, thank you all for joining and thank you so much, Dr. Gaff, for that presentation. It was so interesting. I'm, I'm very glad to know about the work that you're doing. You and your colleagues are researching ticks um, and their uh, ever increasing um, diseases. And I look forward to learning more in the future. So thank you again and thank everyone for joining us.